Joe Fordham is 8-0 for the first time in school history, nationally ranked. And by the way, that history goes back to the 30s and 40s with Vince Lombardi, the seven blocks of granite, a couple of bowl game appearances. What are the critical components that have allowed this team to achieve what it has? I think it's a tremendous testament to our players and our coaching staff that, you know, we came in, in two years ago and said that, you know, we wanted the foundation of our program to be discipline, attention to detail, and, um, you know, doing the little things right on and off the field. And I think the kids have embraced that and that they understand that the true indicator of success on Saturdays is our preparation during the week, our effort, and how well we execute our scheme. So I think a combination of those things has allowed us to build a foundation start last year and, and um, you know, lead us to this point where we are this season. You took over a program that was 1-10. As you mentioned last year, you guys jumped to 6-5. and five. Now you jump to 8-0. and oh. Did you see this coming? Did you see the potential that this could come this quickly? I felt the pieces were in place. And you look at last year's season, we had um, three league losses by a combined eight points. We lost to Lehigh uh, 34-31 as time expired, and they were nationally ranked at the time. We lost to Bucknell by three, and then Colgate was a league champion, and we lost to them by two and you know, missed a two-point conversion at the very, very end of the game. So I felt like the foundation had been laid and we had an opportunity. And the kids worked very hard throughout winter conditioning. Uh, spring ball, summer, and then fall camp, and, um, you know, things, you know, with the first win of the year against Rhode Island, and then kind of where it had gone from there on a weekly basis, beating Villanova, beating Temple, and then the momentum started to pick up, so um, I'd like to think that, that we had the opportunity to do these things this year, but until we did them on the field, you, you really don't realize, you know, the, the importance of you know, how well these kids have played. You know Fordham very well, having been a three-year starting quarterback here yourself. What has this season meant to Fordham, and what should Fordham aspire to be football-wise? You know, football-wise, you know, our goals are to be a perennial Patriot League champion that competes for the national championship um, on a yearly basis. And I think, you know, for us to be able to, you know, achieve our highest ranking in school history and accomplish a bunch of firsts from a program standpoint, it, it's a tremendous testament to our, to our kids and our coaching staff. And, uh, you know, the, the support that we've gotten from the student body and the university community, we've sold out to. Um, home games in a row, and we're well on our way to this week's game against Holy Cross. So the support that we've gotten has been unbelievable, and um, you know we're, we're very thankful. Something that didn't exist when you were here exists now, the fact that you can actually walk into a kid's living room and offer him a scholarship. How has that changed the way you can do business as a coach to be able to recruit a kid and not always have to worry about it being financially based aid? Uh, I think it, it evens the playing field a little bit in terms of recruiting against other scholarship schools. When it was a need-based model, uh, you were generally successful on kids who needed everything or who didn't need anything. And the kids who were in the middle where you were trying to sell a, a Fordham education and Fordham football experience for $20,000 and say, for instance, they had a Villanova or a New Hampshire or one of those other schools, generally speaking, they were going to take the full scholarship. And it was more of an apples to oranges uh, comparison. And now, where, like you said, you can go into a kid's living room and they have a full scholarship offer. You know, versus our, our um, full scholarship offer, it, it puts it on a more even playing field. We're sitting in a locker room now where there are pictures of Vince Lombardi, and you walk on campus, it's the seven blocks of granite. There are pictures of games where Fordham played at Yankee Stadium in the polo grounds back in the 30s and 40s, drew 50,000 people. How much, when you're coaching, can you draw upon that history to motivate your players, to remind your players about chasing greatness? Yeah, it, and this actually where we're sitting now used to be a swimming pool <laughs> when I was a player here. So we've made some strides in the facilities department. But, you know, the history here is ever-present. It, it's kind of hard to ignore. You walk past the seven blocks of Granite Monument on your way into into campus, and you, and you see the kind of historical artifacts, I guess, so to speak, of the remnants of, you know, when Fordham was a um, you know national powerhouse. And we want our kids to respect the past and understand what our tradition is and by the same token, kind of carve our own niche in the future where we want to be at, at the FCS level. You know, I have to slip this in here. You said that this used to be a swimming pool. I used to work right across the way from here when I was a student, washing the uniforms of, of guys like yourself. Now, you're, you're a lot younger than me, but I was in there making sure that the football uniforms were clean. That was my work-study job. Yeah, they, um, and we used to try to avoid getting thrown in the pool by the upperclassmen at the end of the, the last practice of the year. But, yeah, our, our locker room was across the way there, and, um, you know, I think it's, you know, where we're sitting now is just shows a, 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 um, a testament to the commitment that, that our university has made to, to give us a, um, you know, the things necessary to have a successful program. And getting a chance to see your team and watch your team this year, one thing that is unmistakable is you guys have a high-octane offense with some exceptional offensive performers. Where did that come from? Where does it come from? You've talked about how your offensive scheme changes week to week based on who you're playing. Yeah, we're, we're an up-tempo, no-huddle offense, and 
Uh, you know, we want to play as fast as we can and get the ball snapped um, and, and really dictate the tempo of the game to, to the defense and uh, not allow them to give you too many different looks and kind of, you know, really get into the best pay possible against the look presented because we have a bunch of different tempos. But I think you know, our ability to play fast with a limited number of formations and really perfect the plays that we run, and, uh, you know, it really is a personnel game. So we have a very good offensive line that, you know, if we're able to control the line of scrimmage and, you know, move the ball on the ground to protect the passer, we have a really an embarrassment of, of riches at the skill position. So I think that's, that's enabled us to, um, you know, do the things we've done offensively this year. You came over from UConn after having been the offensive coordinator and a quarterback's coach there. And then you also had the good fortune of Michael Niebrick, the quarterback, and to Bucky Jones, one of the receivers, also came from UConn and transferred here. How instrumental have they been to what you guys do offensively? You know, very instrumental. You know, I, I recruited Michael to uh, UConn originally and, you know, I moved on to Fordham. And, you know, Michael just, you know, decided he needed a change of scenery and decided to come here along with to Bucky. And, you know, the quarterback position is one that can affect the game positively or negatively. And, um, you know, Michael's certainly done it in a positive fashion this year. He, he can beat you with his arms, beat you with his legs within the scheme and, and through his improvisational skills, and he's done it while limiting turnovers. So he's had a, an unbelievable season and, you know, hopefully can k- keep it rolling in a positive direction. And Tabucky has, has done a great job assimilating here academically. Like Michael, socially, they both fit in very well. And, you know, Tabucky's, you know, one of our, our three receivers that really can um, have, a, have, a, have a breakout day in a game. You uh, mentioned a couple of days ago, I had the chance to talk to you, that things are kind of moving fast for Fordham right now. As exciting as this is and as much preparation as you're putting in for the games that you have remaining, can you enjoy it? Can you take 30 seconds or a minute a day to just say, wow, we're 8-0, we're nationally ranked. You're sitting here talking about a national championship in football, which a couple of years ago at 1-10, in 10, people would have laughed at that idea. You know, we asked the kids that- the thing that we tell them is focus on the task at hand with tremendous singleness of purpose. And we ask them to go 1-0 and every week. So we tell them not to look back, not to look forward, and just concentrate on the hurdle we're on and don't trip on that one. And uh, I think they've done a tremendous job with that this season. So I think, you know, once the year ends, we'll be able to look back with, with reflection on the things that we've accomplished. And you know, hopefully we've got a lot more football to play. You told me a great story, which I think exemplifies how much this team actually is a team, about your players all going off on an excursion yeah. to see a television show. Why don't you fill uh, us in on that? Well, we, we had a bye week after Yale, and, um, you know, we gave them the entire week off to get healed up and kind of just switch, switched our practice schedule around. And, you know, the group of the guys, offense, defense, starters, non-starters, you know, all, all you know, banded together and got some tickets to the Maury Pervert show in Stanford and went up there and took in the show. So, but, but I think that's indicative of not just, you know, our football program, but Fordham University in general that's, you know, a university that, that espouses the values of men and women for others. And, you know, I think our, our team's a great, a great, um, a great symbol of that. And the Maury Povich show, obviously, it's kind of animated. <laughs> and they were, they had made enough noise that they even got invited back if they would like to come back. Yeah, they did. So they did a great job there. And I haven't seen the broadcast yet. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll say that hopefully it's, it's TiVo'd somewhere and we can watch it after the season. When you got hired, one of the words you used at your press conference was that you were humbled to be named the coach of Fordham University, a place where you had played. Do you still feel that way? Do you still feel humbled by being the head coach here? I do. And my teammates and I would always talk about what we felt the tremendous potential was at Fordham University. You have a world-renowned academic institution in the heart of New York City um, and a beautiful campus. And, you know, we weren't necessarily able to get the corner turned as players. We were 4-6-1 and one my senior year. And you know, and then I'll be able to come back as the coach and, you know, help this program reach the potential that we all felt was capable. It, it is a very, very humbling experience. And you continued on to play in Europe for one season? Yeah, one season. It wasn't NFL Europe. It was, you know, one of the leagues where they, they pay you a little money, give you somewhere to stay, and you get to continue to chase the dream. But, uh, yeah, Munich, Germany, was, it was a good time for the three or four months I was there. One of the interesting things that I've learned about you is football is your job, and you're unbelievably passionate about football. But... You are a baseball guy, too. You really love baseball. Tell me about Joe Moorhead growing up in Pittsburgh, how big a baseball fan you were. Well, b- baseball was actually the first organized sport I played. I believe it was you know, second grade. You know, I played my summer league and continued to play all the way through high school. Um, you know, during summers, I would go home, play, play in a, uh, a rec league there. and actually played here my senior year with, without much success. But, uh, and then um, when I was coaching at Georgetown, still played in the Roy Hobbs League there in the summers. Uh, with a um, one of my wife's employers, so um, you know it's it's a great game, and uh, it was it's been you know you you grew up and it was baseball season you played baseball, football season you played football, basketball you played basketball, but 
yeah, I did, I did still, still have love for the game. Nowadays, I'm sure with your three kids, you set them up and they have play dates. But when you were growing up, your play date was, hey, Dad, drop me off at Three River Stadium, essentially, right? <laughs> yeah. We um, spent a lot of time at, at Three River Stadium going to games. And, you know, you'd get there early as soon as they opened the gates and get a chance to watch batting practice and try to get some autographs and hang out afterwards. And, um, you know, now I have an opportunity to, to, to coach my, my boys, you know, playing baseball and kind of carry on that tradition uh, with my own children and hopefully be able to, you know, we take them back to uh, PNC Park when we go back home to Pittsburgh. And you know, they haven't lost a game since we've been there, I think, in the past three or four seasons. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm very proud to be able to you know, carry the baseball tradition on to my children. How aggressive an autograph seeker were you as a kid? Uh, very aggressive. I, you know, some of the guys, I mean, I was a Mets fan back then, so I, I don't know that that was looked uh, with, upon with too much favor in Pittsburgh. But, you know, that was kind of, I guess, a little bit bandwagon, you'd say. But... You know, the, you know, the Daryl Strawberries, the Dwight Goodens. I, I believe I got Tony Gwynn's, Tim Raines, Marquise Grissom, you know, all, all the teams that would come through um, Three River Stadium back then. But, yeah, you have to have to be persistent. And weren't you also such a Gooden fan that you wore number 16 when you played baseball? Even though you're a lefty, yeah, you I, still wanted to try and beat Doc Gooden? I, yeah, it was, it was, you know, at that time frame, I mean, he was the best there was. And, you know, I emulated him with the high leg kick and tried to throw the fastball and the, the big sweeping curve and uh, – yeah, we're 16 and until, you know, I think high school switched to 32 because uh, 16 was taken. But, yeah, he was certainly a guy I tried to uh, pattern my game after. And you're such a baseball nut that you and I were talking about Gooden and we were talking about his numbers, and you were correcting my numbers. <laughs> and you had you had the ERA was 1.53. Yeah. I think I had it at 1.66 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 80, 85, he was 1.53. Yep. <laughs> Could you throw anywhere near the fastball oh, that Doc Gooden? No. If, we, if we knocked 10 or 12 miles off, could you throw in the 80s? What, what were you, what I, were you bringing? I, I don't think you could add two of, my, two of my velocities together to get to 100. But, yeah, I was probably low 80s, probably somewhere in that range. Do you still find time with all that you have to do with Fordham football to, to get your baseball fix? Uh, my baseball fix now is, you know, is coaching my young kids. And I know it's not necessarily baseball, but watching my daughter play softball. So, you know, my 10-year-old uh, – you know, he plays in summer leagues in Cal Ripken, and my youngest plays t-ball, and then my daughter's basically in travel softball year-round. So uh, aside from that and getting out to a couple games a year, you know, that kind of, kind of, kind of, um, you know, you get your fix out with. Didn't she uh, pitch a no-hitter recently, She did. <laughs> she did. It was a four-inning uh, mercy roll short no-hitter, but a no-hitter is a no-hitter. A no-hitter is a no-hitter. Now, even though you said you were kind of this closet Met fan growing yeah. up in Pittsburgh, how about the Pirates this year? You must have... For all of your friends and your family members who waited so long to see another Pirates postseason, it must have been pretty exciting. No, it was a long drought, and I, I can remember their last uh, postseason appearance was my freshman year here at Fordham, and um, I think it was Francisco Cabrera singled in Sid Bream, and you know he, he was safe at the plate, and that's been a long time coming. So now to see the Pirates get back into the postseason, hopefully you know, with the good young talent they have, they can, they can keep it rolling. And you also had a moment with Dwight Gooden's no-hitter, didn't you? There was something going yeah. on with Dwight Gooden's no-hitter. Did you have tickets to that game, no, Joe, if it, I recall it, correctly? It was, it was a choice. We had just graduated from Fordham, and the choice was go home and spend a little time with family or go head down to the game and chose to go home and miss the no-hitter. <laughs> but you still feel family-wise you made the right decision. Yeah, and got to watch it on TV, but I'm not sure that's much solace. Well, I want to have a little fun with you because I know you're such a, a big baseball guy. We always, we always end this show by pulling out some baseball cards. Now, All here's right. a choice. We got, we got 2013. We can both open a pack of the 2013s. Or I went old school because I know your error. We got a 90 and an 88. I'll take the 88. You're going to take the 88. What we're going to do is we're going to open these and we're going to see who's got the best card. We're going to have a little okay. debate here. It's going to be our own little sports baseball talk show. I like it. I hope there's no gum in here because I'm not eating it if there is. Ooh, the big cat. You're off to a good start. Kevin oh, I got Willie Wilson. I like that. Kurt Stillwell, Tony Phillips, Fred McGriff, 493 homers. Tom Candiotti. Ooh, I'm saving this guy. I may have a, I got a pretty good one right here. Doug Bear, Tom Kerr, Sean Dunstan. He's a Bronx kid. Geronimo First Perot, pick overall. Lloyd Mosby. Ooh, on the uh, on the heels of uh, Colton Wong last night, I got a Bill Buckner. Oof, oh, oof. I can I remember where I was with my grandparents' fiftieth wedding anniversary and heard the heard it on the radio. All right, I got two things here that are pretty impressive. You got anybody that's you're bringing to the forefront here? I'm gonna have to here? go with Vince Coleman. All right, Vince Coleman, but he Vince Coleman cannot 
hold a candle to oh, Ryan, no. Ryan no, Sandberg. You You're the winner. And then how about this? I don't even know what this is, but it's a little like reflective thing. Oh. It's Roberto Clemente. Oh, number Pittsburgh 21. Guy. There you go. I mean, you're the you're the winner on two accounts. I'm the winner, but you know what? I don't know what you'll do with that, but I'm going to give that to you because I. Well, my kids have started collecting, so this is going to go in their books. So we'll keep that one. Where um, you mentioned national championship, are those your thoughts right now, or as you said, are you just trying to get week by week? Our thoughts are, are to go one and zero on a weekly basis, and you know. All of our thoughts right now are on what we have to do to prepare to beat Holy Cross, and, and that's going to be a big task because they've you know, got a tremendous young freshman quarterback and, and they're very multiple on defense. So, you know, we're going to pour everything that we have into our preparation this week, and hopefully we have another sellout crowd here and, and do everything we can to be 1 0 this week. All right, well, you lost the baseball card yeah. challenge, but hopefully for you and Fordham folks and Fordham alums like myself, hopefully you win on Saturday. Thank you very much. Joe, thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.